Howdy Pards, Wheels and Lovers here coming to you from the Pedagogical Penthouse. <clears throat> After a couple of videos I did yesterday on politics, history, that kind of stuff. Got a couple of questions asking me to go into some more detail, trying to get some more background information. So. What I have in the background here is the Federalist 10, written by James Madison. The website is the uh, Avalon Law Project from Yale, but all, all you got to do is search Federalist 10 and you, you can find the text. Of course, James Madison is the primary author of the United States Constitution. He is the author of the Federalist 10. The Federalist Papers were a series of essays written by Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, and John Jay. John Jay was the first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. <clears throat> Alexander Hamilton was Secretary of the Treasury under uh, George Washington. Uh, I would say Alexander Hamilton is actually the person who had the most influence on the development of the institutions of the United States, the National Bank, strong and executive, <clears throat> been wanted by Madison and Jefferson, for example. Separate, separate uh, Supreme Court, da, 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 all this stuff. Um, so actually, even though Madison is the, the author of the Constitution, I'd say Hamilton ended up having more influence on the way, that, uh, on the direction of the country's history. <clears throat> but the Federalist Number Ten is the most famous of all the Federalist Papers. There's 85 of them, a series of essays written to the people of the state of New York to convince New Yorkers to ratify the Constitution. Uh, this one is from November 22nd, 1787. This is the first one written by Madison. That's his 23rd, but I see 22nd is the date as well. John Jay was originally the one who was helping uh, Hamilton. Uh, they were both New Yorkers, um, but Jay became ill, so he asked Madison to help him write some. And Federalist 10, written by Madison, Federalist 51, are probably the two most famous of the Federalist papers. Federalist 78. Probably the next uh, Hamilton wrote that one's about the Supreme Court. So I'd encourage you to read this stuff. Now, <clears throat> the reason specifically I, I wanted to go over some of Federalist Number Ten is because uh, some of the terms that I use, a commercial republic. What, what, what do we mean by a commercial republic? The United States is a commercial republic. Now, this presupposes the state system that I mentioned yesterday in the videos uh, that was established by the Peace of Westphalia in 1648. We have a separate nation state. That's the state, what we think of as a nation. Uh, and whatever the state determines to be their particular form of government is their business. <clears throat> and other states will not try to interfere in their internal Affairs. That was basically the agreement reached in, in the Peace of Westphalia. And the most important thing is the state, whatever religions or religions, plural, they decided to permit in their state, would, you wouldn't get interference from other countries. And i.e., uh, you wouldn't have the Catholics trying to reestablish uh, uh, Catholic control over these areas. So basically, it's, it's a victory for Protestants. This is why, to some extent, <clears throat> even though it is true that the United States so-called separation of church and state, that in and of itself is a Protestant idea. And it's very difficult for peoples and societies that have not developed along the lines similar to those that resulted from the Protestant Reformation. It's very difficult for them to enter in this form of government and make it work well. They typically don't. They may have some modified forms of Republican government, but they, they, they tend not to be as wealthy, as free, that kind of stuff, as those with the, the, the heritage that stems directly from the Protestant Reformation. Look at a map of GDP, or just average income, you know, per capita income in nations, you will see that the nations that have the that are have the highest GDP or per capita income 
tend to be those uh, former Protestant areas. Uh, now, you, you can throw up Japan and South Korea. Uh, they, they were literally established by the United States. So <laughs> that, that's, that doesn't work either. <clears throat> and without them continuing to be a protectorate of the United States, we, you know, now from China, was from the Soviet Union, now we're protecting from China, they would not enjoy the standard of living that they currently enjoy. So they, they are living under the umbrella of United States military power, without which immediately their prosperity vanishes, goes away, none, it's gone. They're controlled by China in this instance. So the United States is a commercial republic. What does that mean? Well, Madison tells us what it means in the Phyllis number 10. That's why I'm going to go into this in some detail. Probably I'm going to break this up into a series of videos. I'm talking about, okay, what is a commercial republic? How is it based on the state system of government that we've discussed? What is it that has changed, I'd say, in the last two generations, basically with the uh, widespread coming into existence of you know, what you could call the, you know, the post-industrial economy, the digital revolution computers, microcomputers. That literally changes the economic conditions of the day -to -day, in the day-to-day -day habits of people, Americans and those who, who participate in this, which is Western civilization and those under the influence of Western civilization. And this has resulted in social transformations, which has made the old commercial republic less viable than it was based as it was literally on industry. I mean, there, there's no question that they anticipated that this coming into existence. Before that, it was agriculture. What, what does this mean? Uh, because uh, in the post-industrial age, in the, in the you know, digital economy, the rapidity of social change increases rapidly, and it is by no means a foregone conclusion that this is sustainable. Contrary to what uh, you know, the technocrats think. Uh, no, we we don't know for sure that it is sustainable. So we're going to talk about the commercial republic, what it is, how this is tied to the U.S. Constitution and the form of government the Constitution lays out, and you know the stuff then that goes on. We'll probably talk about. In future videos. Okay, now, Federalist number 10, the subject of which is the Union as a safeguard against domestic faction and insurrection. Uh, it's the same subject written in Federalist number 9, which was written by Hamilton. This is written by Madison, and he gives us his, his view of the matter. I, that, even though Hamilton is more influential, I think, Madison is probably more uh, in terms of, of being a, 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 a person able to see the broad scope of history where they were at the time that this was being done, which was 1787, where things were going. I think he's, he's better at explaining that kind of stuff than Hamilton. Uh, but Hamilton, certainly very good. Now, a faction, you know, what is a faction? Well, he gives us his definition of faction. I'm not going to read this word for word, but I'm going to go over some, some what I think of, of as the important parts of it that will help us understand what a commercial republic is, <clears throat> why the United States is this thing, and why it is now that we are undergoing a, an economic transformation that is resulting in a, a transformation of, of behavior in our society why this is causing instability and violence. All right, by a faction, I understand a number of citizens, whether amounting to a majority or minority of the whole, who are united and actuated by some common impulse of passion or interest adverse, shouldn't be adverse, but adverse to the rights of other citizens, such as the permanent and aggregate interests of the community. That's a faction. Now, you'll often hear uh, pundits that talk about, well, parties are factions. Yes, they are. Parties are good. No, they're not. But in any event, it doesn't matter if they're good or bad. That, that's not the issue here. 
a political party is a faction. It's a particular kind of faction. The faction is broader than that. Any group of citizens that gets together to pursue their political interest is a faction. Now, it is true that this could be adverse to the rights of citizens, but it's important to point out here that as Madison discusses faction here, it's not inherently good or bad. It can be either one. That's the great thing about the founders is that they, they, they didn't just say, well, this is absolutely good. And they said, no, it's good in this way and it's bad in this way. And we have to admit that this is the way it is, that then has Madison's going to say it's sown in the nature of man, that these the seeds of action are sown in the nature of man, that this is tied to human nature, and that therefore it is unavoidable. And, and it doesn't matter that the goody two-shoes of the world would like to create utopia as heaven on earth. It's not going to happen. Which, you know, and he refers to this in Federalist 51. He said, you know, if, if, if men were angels, you wouldn't need government. Which is essentially, you know, the Marxist dream. Is the state will wither away and we'll just have utopia with everybody being equal. And da, 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 na, 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 na. Which, by the way, Madison warned about in Federalist number 10. So a party is a faction, but a faction is, it can be of any interest group is a faction. Any of your letters, NAACP, ACLU. N R A K K K W W W whatever they're factions. <clears throat> they get together and they pursue their interests to the exclusion of others. There, there you go. Now again, this is not necessarily good or bad. It's just the way human beings are because we are, as Aristotle said, by nature social, which makes us by nature political. Which doesn't mean that whatever political system arises. Is necessarily good just like you know it's natural to eat but everything you eat isn't good same thing with politics um, it's natural for uh, human beings to form political associations that doesn't make them all equally good <clears throat> all right so that's that's the faction now he goes on and talks about the causes of faction and he, and he gives a famous analogy of um, you can't remove the causes, and he talks about, and he gives the analogy of air. He says, just as air imparts the destructive agency to fire, so liberty <clears throat> is the underlying cause of faction. If people are going to be free, which is, you know, that's to some extent, that's what the United States wants. It wants them to be free to pursue commerce. That's the, the main reason to be free, by the way. It's not to vote. I'm not talking anything about voting in here. It's another thing these, these idiots come up with. Oh, you're going to vote your way to free. You're not voting your way to anything. Antonin Scalia, you say, you know, you can vote and have yourself a bill of rights. Every tin pot dictator has those things, and, and people aren't free. What guarantees our freedom is the structure of the government and property. Madison's big on property, as, as we will see. That goes with the commercial republic. That is the substance, the stuff, the resources, which are at your disposal, which enables you to fend off tyranny. Without it, you can't fend off tyranny. Voting doesn't allow you to fend off tyranny because of the problem of faction. If there's a majority faction and it's majority rule, which, by the way, we don't have, <clears throat> then you got no way to stop tyranny. But the idiots of the world want you to think so, so that they can take over and then tell you, well, you voted for it. Hmm. I didn't vote for it. But the majority did. Well, that violates the, the principles on which the country is actually based, which is not majority rule, but rather individual liberty. But we'll talk more about that as we go through. So Madison gives the, the analogy of, you know, air is to fire as liberty is to faction. And just as fire can be harmful, so can liberty be harmful. So what we want to do is we want to structure a government in such a way as to control its effects. He talks about the causes, so we can't we can't remove the causes. All right, now the thing that I really want to get into is in this particular paragraph here, the second expedient. You know, the, for the first one is liberty. The second one he talks about is trying to give everyone the same opinions, the same thoughts and all. This is, by the way, this rejection of this is why the founders weren't interested in public education. That gave the government too much power in their estimation. It wasn't until industrialization was well underway and it became apparent 
to the industrial elite at least that they needed a, a minimum standard of education in, in the population of the Goober boys out there so that they'd be ready to work. That public education became the accepted means of education in the United States. First hundred years it was not. And this is the reason why. <clears throat> uh, they don't want to give every citizen the same opinions, the same passions, and the same interests. Now, that was the way that the ancient Greek polis, Athens, Sparta, Corinth, so on and so forth, they tried to give everyone, but those were small entities. A polis is you know, it's a city of maybe 10,000 citizens. There may have been a lot more people around, but they weren't citizens. They didn't get to participate in government. And uh, Madison says, you know, if liberty is is the thing here, then we don't, then we, you know, it's not proper to try to educate everyone the same. They need to be free to be educated on their own. Now, you know, the, the response of uh, later on when we get them up in history, certainly today, is, well, their mommies and daddies won't educate them. That's right, but that's their problem. Which goes to another thing, is going to, which is equality. We're about to talk about you know, there's no equality. You know, they, you know, Madison flat out denies it. I can see him talking to Jefferson and say, you know that equality nonsense you talked about in the in the Declaration of Independence? You sowed the seeds for the future destruction of the United States with that nonsense. Yes, it was a nice little slogan for us to use for the for the revolution, but it's not true. It's anthropologically incorrect. But it is appealing to the masses, and uh, you, you know, you, you just demagogued your way into the future uh, annihilation of the United States with that nonsense, and that's that's what happened. Now he tries to offset it. All right, so the latent causes of faction are sown in the nature of man, and we see them everywhere, brought into different degrees of activity according to the different circumstances of civil society and zeal for different opinions concerning religion, concerning government. And many other points. We certainly have that now. As well as speculation as, as a practice and attachment to different leaders ambitiously contending for preeminence and power. We certainly have that now. Or to persons of other descriptions whose fortunes have been interesting to the human passions have in turn divided mankind. Actually, I went, I went too far, but I'll go ahead and, and finish this uh, sentence. Uh, inflamed them with mutual animosity. We have a lot of that now. <clears throat> and rendered them much more disposed to vex and oppress each other than to cooperate for their common good. So Madison anticipated the point at which we are at this very moment in U.S. history. They knew it was going to happen. What I just read there is a spot-on description of, of, of the way things are in the United States right now. All right, let's go back up to the previous paragraph. I, I went down too far to explain what's going on. The second expedient, which is the one of trying to educate everyone the same, is as impractical as the first would be unwise. <clears throat> as long as the reason of man continues fallible and he is at liberty to exercise it, different opinions will be formed. As long as the connection subsists between his reason and his self-love, his opinions and his passions will have a reciprocal influence on each other. They'll feed off each other. And the formal, former will be objects to which the latter will attach themselves. Now, the next two sentences are the two most important sentences ever written in the United States. I would like to have some form of this tattooed on the forehead of every lefty to get through their heads that the United States of America is not based on equality. It isn't. It's anthropologically untrue. Human beings are not equal. You can't make them equal without making the government tyrannical. And it is not the purpose of the Constitution of the United States to establish equality. Now, you got the phrase in the 14th Amendment that, you know, equal protection of the laws. That doesn't mean everybody's made equal. That means you have, you're supposed to have equal protection. I mean, you know, that you're not supposed to have, you know, like, for example, where you have these zones now where the police basically don't operate that's not supposed to happen it's supposed to have the protection of the law that's what that means everybody has equal protection that doesn't mean that they're equal or made equal or anything else 
that means that they are equally protected by the law. All right, here we go. These two sentences. If you don't take anything else away, this is what you need to take away. <clears throat> the diversity in the faculties of men from which the rights of property originate is not less an insuperable obstacle to the uniformity of interest. The protection of these faculties is the first object of government. All right, diversity in the faculties of men. Now, the left likes to holler about diversity. diversity. Here you go. They don't really mean it. What they want is uniformity. They want enforced opinions on diversity and then a uniform, then a uniformity in, in, in reality. Yeah, as I say, the up is down and down is up with these people. They, they, they literally don't, do not know their butt from a hole in the ground. The diversity in the faculty, some people are more intelligent than others. Now, faculties is being used in a broader sense than this. He's not just talking about intelligence, Madison, is it? But faculties in this period, this is a term used by Kant, famous Enlightenment philosopher, same time period. Second critique of pure reason published, 1787, same time this was. Faculties means intelligence, but it also means your character, your predispositions, your instincts, all of the things that go into making you, you, you an individual as a human being. That's where the property of, uh, that's where the, the, you know, property rights originate. Now, in general, I don't like rights politics, but this is true insofar as it goes, as, as it is being described by Madison. That you have these endowments, you have certain characteristics and it is from this that property that those things are yours. That's what makes you you. And those things in turn, in how you apply your endowments, your faculties, will result in different levels of acquisition of property. That's the reason for the existence of the United States, as he says. The protection of these faculties is the first object of the first object of government. It's not to be it's not to make you equal. It's not so you can vote. It's the protection of the faculties that result in an unequal distribution of property. Now a crude way of putting this would be to say that the reason for the existence of the United States is to protect rich people. But it, it's broader than that. It's not just rich people that are protected. It's it's others. It's 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 anyone's property that is supposed to be protected. That's why this is a commercial republic. It's based on property. Later on in Federalist 10, Madison says that those countries of the past <clears throat> that attempted to be based on religion or morals didn't work well. They're unstable. Property is, is more stable. You, it doesn't matter what your religion or your moral system is anymore to some extent. I mean, you've got to have a modicum of morals, the protection of property. <clears throat> If we, we can all set that stuff aside and agree to make money together, that's basically what the United States is about. That's why it's a commercial republic. The protection of the diversity in the faculties of men that results in an unequal distribution of property is the reason for the existence of the United States. That's where it begins and that's where it ends. Which is why now, when we experience social change that moves us away from that, you got problems. Contrary to what the, uh, the left thinks, the Constitution is not alive. It's a, it's a piece of paper. It attempts to put down certain fundamental aspects of human nature, and this is one of them, which I uh, think is true that they got it right, <clears throat> and govern based on that, and certain things are unchangeable. Human nature being one of them. Notwithstanding the very slow ev evolution of species, that could result in a change, but that it, it, it hasn't changed in 240 years. All right. From the protection of different and unequal faculties of acquiring property, the protection, the possession of different degrees of and kinds of property immediately results, and from these, uh, the influence. And from the influence of these on the sentiments and views of the respective proprietors ensues a division of society into different interests and parties, into different factions. 
So the protection of the faculties that resulted in unequal distribution of property are going to result in all these different factions and the, the, with the United States of America, the Constitution that establishes the federal government is there to not stop this from happening and not to equalize everyone, but it's structured in such a way as so to try to prevent any one faction from gaining all power. That's what the Federalist Tim is about. Then he goes on in the second half of Federalist Tim to talk about the size. He anticipates the United States becoming a continental nation, which is why this nonsense when they start talking about manifest destiny from the mid-19th century, uh, they, 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 you know, Madison and Jefferson, these guys, they, are, they, they knew that the U.S. was going to be a continental nation when, when they wrote the Constitution. There was no doubt in their minds that that was the way things were going. Now, the problem that immediately arises in the United States after the ratification of the Constitution and these basic principles laid down here by Madison is that you had the new form of economy coming into existence at this time and it certainly came in and started in the early 19th century. That's industrialization, which is at odds with the old agrarian economy. So Jefferson was still in the agrarian economy. He wanted the United States to be an agrarian nation. Hamilton wanted the United States to be an industrial nation. Madison tried to moderate between the two, but he understood the direction was the one that Hamilton had outlined, which is industrialization. And he talks so he and he goes on in, in the Federalist Ten and then talks about, you know, there's a, a landed interest, a manufacturing interest, a moneyed interest, a mercantile interest, da 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 da. But he points out that there is going to be a conflict in the future between the agrarian, that's the South, and the industrial north. That's what leads to the Civil War, by the way, not slavery. Slavery is a sub-issue of that. There has never been a society in the history of the world whose primary means of economic production was agriculture that did not have slavery. Never. There won't be, because those societies don't produce enough wealth to distribute among everyone. Industrial societies do. And, of course, there was a war fought between the North and the South, the North won, and became a fully industrialized nation. So that's the reason I wanted to go into this on the commercial basis of the United States. Now, since roughly the 1980s, certainly by the 1990s, the digital revolution in the economy and the move away in the United States from being an industrial manufacturing based economy to being a digital computerized economy has resulted in a shift not unlike the shift that occurred from an agrarian society to an industrial society and now from an industrial to a post-industrial society with a digital economy. And just as the shift from an agrarian economy to an industrial economy resulted in violence and uh, a, a change in, in behavior and morals and things like that, so too those same same changes, but they you know they did not change in the same way. But it is it, the same things. A, the the underlying economic basis. Uh, of the way people live their day to day lives has changed in the last 40 years, and this has resulted in social change, which has disintegrated the old ways of, uh, in the commercial republic, which was still to some extent, even though it was not based entirely on religion, based, it was built on the foundations that had been laid by Protestant Christianity and the family unit. Mommy, daddy, Bobby and Sue. Now that had begun to, you know, take place, you know, in the 60s and 70s. Then it was even sped up in the 80s and 90s with the uh, increase in wealth that made it possible for families to break up. It wasn't possible because there, the resources weren't available prior to that. They begin to become available in the post World War II era, 60s and 70s, <clears throat> and then it economy really takes off in the 80s and 90s and that's what makes possible this uh, economic transformation <clears throat> now the rapidity of social change that occurs in a digital world 
is much faster than that which had occurred in, in an industrial world, which was in turn already much faster than that which had occurred in an agrarian world. And as I said, there's no guarantee that this is something that is going to be sustainable that this transformation will not result in uh, violent upheavals that literally brings down civilization. I mean, this stuff does happen, historically speaking. Now, the reality is, I mean, you got to think about broad sweeps of history. People don't like doing this, but it doesn't matter. It's just what you need to do. From the Neolithic Revolution, you know, going back to 7,000 B.C., the domestication of agriculture, plants and animals, from that time until the Industrial Revolution, let's say till roughly 1800, from 7,000 BC to 1800, the primary means of economic production was agrarian agriculture. Then you experienced the shift with industrialization that was made possible by the European Enlightenment. And let's not kid ourselves here, it was a European Enlightenment. This is not ethnically based, but it is culturally based. You know, the, the Protestant Reformation led to the Enlightenment, in turn led to the Commercial Republic, in turn led to the industrialization of Western civilization. Those things happened in Europe. They, did, they didn't happen elsewhere. So this is this stuff you, you want to start on the illusion. No, no, they're not all equal. If, if they are, you, you're welcome to go, you know, go live in the Amazon jungle where they, they still don't have uh, not only digital stuff, I mean, in some places, but not all of them. Uh, they, they're not even industrialized yet. You know, these people who like to complain about this stuff, uh, you know, they, you, you got to listen to, you know, you, I shouldn't say this, you don't need to listen to what they say, you need to watch what they do. What they actually do is they participate in, in the post industrial economy because they like that better, because of the facility and ease of life in this economy. And yet they want to know the old cultures are equal. No, they're not. <laughs> if, if they were, you wouldn't be here right now. You, you'd go out there and, and equally participate in, in other things, but you're, you're not interested in doing that. So from the Neolithic Revolution until the Industrial Revolution, obviously there was social change and you had to rise and fall of, of civilizations. But the basic agrarian substructure of the economy was the same. Um, then you get the transformation, dramatic increase in wealth brought about by industrialization and mass production. Results in dramatic changes that resulted in World War I and World War II, at the conclusion of which we had computers and nuclear weapons. And very shortly thereafter, we get the transition from an industrial economy <clears throat> To the digital kind of computer-based economy. Now, all of these things presuppose the previous building blocks, let us say. So we still need agriculture, obviously. We still need some industry, obviously, for the stuff that it makes on which our digital things are based. <clears throat> the plastics, the steels, the, the you know, the whatnot, all that stuff still has to be manufactured, that's true. And you still have to eat food, that's true. But those aren't the things agriculture and manufacturing, those things don't generate as much wealth as the digital stuff. So you're touching the computer. So that's why you're not going back to that. And all the demagoguery in the world about industrial power, no, you're not going to be. It's like you're not going to go back to being an agricultural power. Now, we are an agricultural power, but I mean, our economy is not based on agriculture. The means of production have shifted. And this is not a Marxist argument because Madison has it before Marxism ever came around. You know, Adam Smith argument, you might say. Commercial Republic argument. <clears throat> David Hume, who was good buddies with Adam Smith. Um, those things, we are, we are in the process of experiencing the social changes that were brought about by the digital revolution in the economy, and we don't know how those are going to shake out. And we don't know that the commercial republic and the old state form of government is going to survive now because just as industrialization of trains and telegraphs and things literally made the world smaller insofar as you could get 
places much faster and communicate much faster. It's the same thing now. You can communicate instantaneously just about anywhere in the world. Things can be shipped very quickly almost anywhere in the world. So globalization is here to stay. These who are trying to, you know, think that they're going to go back. No, you're not. You're not just like the after the Civil War. The South wasn't going back to an agrarian economy. They tried to. Didn't work until they finally gave that up. It took almost 100 years and, and industrialized. <clears throat> they didn't experience the kind of uh, economic growth and prosperity that, you know, the old uh, Union had experienced. And the same thing here. Holding on to the old, you know, the dream of the steel and stuff. It's it's not it's not happening. You're not going back to that. Do you need that? Yes, just as we still needed food. But that's not going to be where the center of power is anymore because it's not what it generates as much wealth as much property. So the commercial aspect of civilization is still present, but it's no longer. The technology has literally outstripped the state and become global. And it doesn't matter <clears throat> if you like this or not. You know, it is the same thing would be like, you know, uh, saying you don't like gravity. Gravity doesn't care if you like it. It's prejudiced against trap people. Maybe so, but it, it, it doesn't care. Same thing. Globalization doesn't care that you uh, still want to manufacture steel in Pittsburgh. You want to make too much money for doing it. Some guy over in India or China will do it for one-tenth the price that you will do it for. We need tariffs. No, you don't need tariffs. That's an artificial increase in the price. What you need is competition. You need to adjust to the realities of the economy in which you live. You want to be able to manufacture steel? Go live in China. You don't have political freedom. That's right. <laughs> So, I mean, you got to make your decision. You, know, you can't have everything. So we're not going back to being, you know, the, the, the economy is not going to be based on manufacturing. It's going to be based on what it is. We're still going to have manufacturing. It says we still have agriculture. But we're in, in the social changes that go with this stuff are, are, are here. Unwed mothers, abortion. Dissolution of the family. Now, again, no, 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 just because they're here doesn't mean that it's here to stay. I'm not saying that. Because it's, as I said, it's not um, a foregone conclusion that these are sustainable ways of doing things. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure they're not. You can use technology to, to, to smooth it out to some extent, but they're still there. And we are seeing them now as a consequence of the so called pandemic. Where those who were on the on the lower rung of socioeconomic ladder were the ones most affected economically by the pandemic, and this is causing real problems that we are going to experience for years. And the left brought this on, not caring that they were going to initiate social change that could very well erupt into a violent insurrection because they want political power. They want to be able to use the crisis that will be generated through this, just like they did with the Great Depression in World War II, to expand the power of the government. And they want to be able to take control of that government, and they want power. That's all they care about. That's all they want. They're a faction that wants to control things. Technology is making it possible for them to control. Now, is it going to work? No, <laughs> it's not. That's something that I mean. They don't. They don't seem to understand that the majority of citizens, and even though we don't have a majority system rule, you still have to take into account where the citizens actually are, how they actually are, are not going to go along with that at this point. Just because a bunch of uh, 18 to 25 year old goobers take to the streets, uh, th those aren't the people who control the wealth in the nation. It's older people who do. Uh, and so, uh, no, you're not bringing about this radical transformation of, of society on some left wing dream of uh, the dissolution of the family and the state like this. 
a minimum of three generations, a minimum. And even so, there's, as, uh, since it's probably not sustainable, there's no, there's no guarantee that will happen. Now, it may be if technology advances fast enough to cover that up. So we'll like, you know, the little talk of the little chips to put in you. Uh, this may be able to be used to, let's say, help determine, you know, potential health problems and you get some kind of state run health system and they could uh, be able to effectively give you medical care for less money. But I say could, there's no, there's no guarantee that this will happen. And then that would alleviate some of the problems that go along with the, the biological necessities of uh, human life on a day-to-day -day basis. There are certainly the resources generated uh, available to make that happen in the United States, at least and in the West, but not in the whole world. You know, there's over 7 billion people, maybe 8 billion people by now for all I know. There's not enough resources for that for the whole world. There is for the wealthier countries. But we got to get them from other places of the world. So perhaps something like that, but it hasn't happened yet, and there's no guarantee that it will happen. But that's the direction toward which things are. We're going from a commercial republic to something else. What that will be? It'll be some type of globalized world government. It will still presuppose the commercial aspects of society, because they still have to generate the wealth necessary to make this possible which still presupposes the agricultural aspects of biological necessity, the manufacturing needs of the digital machines, da, 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 all those things will still be present. But they won't be the driving forces because they're not the things that generate the wealth that result in the resources. So that's where things are going. That's why we are experiencing the social upheaval now that we are experiencing, but there's, there's, a, there's no guarantee that this is going to go smoothly. Almost certainly it won't. It certainly didn't go, I mean, we had to have World War One and World War Two to work out the problems from industrialization. So, is there, you know, is something similar in the, maybe, who knows? Um, but, you know, the reality is the upcoming political season with the elections are a flashpoint that could result in the, you know, these factions uh, reacting violently. That, that's my point. So in the immediate future, literally less than a month away, uh, I would not be surprised to see a general conflagration uh, resulting from the transformations that we just talked about about the news media will try to pitch it in terms of uh, racism income inequality which we're supposed to have this kind of nonsense you know, without uh, taking into account the real factors of which they may not even be aware that I've just been talking about, of the social transformation being brought about by the transition of the underlying economic conditions that have attended the transformation of the economy from a manufacturing base to a digital base. That's what's causing it. It's not racism. It's not income inequality. It's not, those things are just, you know, uh, epiphenomena that occur as a consequence of the underlying economic changes brought about by digitalization. And they are fomented by demagogues who uh, want to start hollering about nonsensical things like equality, as if that's got anything to do with race. Now, there's not enough genetic variation in the human species for there really to be such a thing as race in the first place. Because people have different color skin doesn't, doesn't, doesn't mean anything. You have two, you know, you have dogs of the same breed that are different colors. They're, they're still the same breed of dog. There's not even as much genetic variation in the human species as there is in any of those things. So um, there really isn't such a thing. 
and yet you've got those demagogues out there who want to drum up problems to take advantage of situations so they can obtain power without regard to the problems that they cause as a consequence of that. And the, the idiots of the world are, are willing to go along with it because of the diversity in the faculties of men. That diversity, I mean, it's real. It's not going away. It's not equal. It, the, the diversity is real. Remember, they don't really want diversity. They want uniformity of opinion about their view of diversity. That's what they want. They want true diversity. So that's what we got. Now, I'm going to continue on with this in, in other videos about, you know, the different uh, ways in which this has manifested itself, go into more detail about the transformation from manufacturing to a digital-based economy, the broader sweep of history and how this kind of stuff fits together. Uh, so in future videos, we will talk about that, but it's time to bring this one to an end. So I will see you in the next video.